Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History. How powerful was a Roman Emperor? This video is a collaboration between my channel and the SPQR Historian, a YouTube channel that looks at the history of Rome. Please make sure you check out part 1 on his channel, which I'll look at the power of a Roman Emperor during the early Empire from Augustus to Diocletian. You can find a link to his video in the description below. The crisis of the 3rd century, which had lasted from AD 235 to 284, changed the Roman Empire considerably. With nearly 50 years of constant foreign wars and civil wars, devastation and plague, the Roman Empire had had to adapt to survive. The Emperor was no longer the first amongst equals, or princeps, that Augustus had created, a kind of monarch that worked in a republican system. Now the Emperor was Lord and Master, or Dominus Noster. He was the absolute ruler of everything from Hadrian's Wall to the banks of the Nile. Or was he? To understand the power of the Emperor in the late Roman Empire, we need to understand what had changed during the 3rd century that allowed the Romans to drop the pretense of republicanism and embrace monarchy. The Roman Emperor had to lead his armies into battle against the various enemies attacking the Empire. As a result of the Emperor being on perpetual campaign, the Emperor almost never visited Rome. In fact, the Emperor Aemilian never even stepped foot in it. It could be said that the capital of the Empire was not Rome anymore, but where the Emperor was. Because the Emperor was rarely in Rome, the Senate and the Praetorian Guard started to diminish in power as the Emperor was never there. Also, who was the Emperor? With so many Emperors lasting a few months, or even a few weeks in the 3rd century, and with rival Emperors in Gaul and Palmyra, as well as near constant usurpers, power within the Empire almost entirely lay with the army. Diocletian, who was ultimately responsible for ending the 3rd century crisis, enacted sweeping reforms to make sure that the crisis never happened again. He was the first that introduced into the Roman Empire a ceremony suited rather to royal usages than to Roman liberty, as one Roman author put it. The Emperor now adopted a diadem and robes set with jewels. New and elaborate court ceremonies were introduced to make the Emperor not just a man, but something more. The Emperor became a thing of awe, even more so than before, and with the rigorous enforcement of the imperial cult, they were now revered as semi-divine. Even damaging a statue of the Emperor was considered an assault on the Emperor himself. For the first time since Augustus, Diocletian attempted to define what an Emperor actually was, in an attempt to prevent usurpers. He knew better than anyone else, since Diocletian was himself a usurper. But what happened if he died? Chaos. Time and again, 3rd century emperors had proclaimed relatives emperor, but all of them, with a couple of exceptions, had been eliminated not long after becoming emperor, assuming they were not killed beforehand. Diocletian's solution was not to have just one emperor, or two, but four. Imperial power was shared between Diocletian and his colleague Maximian from 285 to 305. Constantius I and Galerius were their heirs, and also held similar powers to them. This helped retain the power of the Emperor by making the office more robust. Diocletian introduced a professional bureaucracy drawn from the Equites, the class of gentlemen below the senators. Provinces were divided to make them smaller and easier to administer, while extra layers of administrators were added to make the system tougher and more resistant to drawn-out conflict. Military and civil officers were also divided. It was no longer the case that one man had total control over a province. For example, the military governor would have the responsibility of commanding his troops, but the civil governor would be entrusted with supplying them with their pay, arms and provisions. Though far more prone to corruption, the late Roman administration never broke down in the same way the Principate's administration had in the 3rd century. 
An emperor still had many limitations on their power. He now had to work with a cabinet of bureaucrats known as the consistory that carried out all of the empire's functions and turned the emperor's word into law. However, sometimes making a law was not enough and people could take advantage of the many layers of officialdom in the way of the emperor. Sometimes the power of the emperor was limited by sheer practicality. When Diocletian decided to issue his Edict of Maximum Prices to fix the price of a vast array of goods, he had to repeal it within a year because everyone ignored it. The army still held significant power within the empire. Diocletian dated his reign to when his troops proclaimed him emperor rather than when the senate granted him the title. Many emperors became emperor because the army proclaimed them so, rather than by any succession or the senate. Maxentius was proclaimed emperor by the Praetorian Guard in 306, which eventually led to the regiment being disbanded. With the Christianization of Constantine the Great in 312, a new power arose in the late Roman Empire, the Church. The imperial cult, the veneration of the office of emperor, was still practiced because there were still many pagans in the empire. While the church was ultimately subservient to the emperor, the emperor was subservient to God, which could allow churchmen close to the emperor to exert enormous power over them. For example, after Theodosius the Great massacred the rioting population of Thessalonica, St. Ambrose excommunicated him and made Theodosius do penance like King David. At the same time, the church absorbed the emperor into their world view. The imperial family remained important and perhaps became even more so in establishing and maintaining an emperor's power. The usurper Procopius was able to get legions to defect to him because he was related to the Constantinian family. The longest reigning emperor of the Roman Empire from antiquity was not a statesman like Augustus or a soldier like Constantine, but Theodosius II, who became emperor when he was seven years old and reigned alone for 42 years. He never experienced a revolt and had to fend off Attila the Hun. His being a descendant of Theodosius the Great, though not the sole reason, helped deter others from seizing power from him. A new power broker in the late Roman Empire were barbarians. Not the invading Huns and Goths penetrating the frontiers, but the descendants of settlers that had worked their way into the Roman army and imperial court. Several emperors were thrust into the role by these barbarian generalissimos, such as Rissima, who helped depose and install five different emperors. An increasing trend in the late Roman Empire was that the emperor in the 5th century, who was more often than not a child, was a puppet, and their barbarian commander was the real power behind the throne. Even the last emperor of the West, Romulus Augustus, was a figurehead for his father Orestes that held real power. This was also partially true in the East, but after 399 it was not barbarian generalissimos, but powerful women, eunuchs, and native Roman soldiers that generally held the reins of power. To conclude, Diocletian embraced the autocratic power that they had wielded since Augustus. The emperor was at the very top of every hierarchy. However, there were many limitations to the emperor's power. Most emperors worked with imperial colleagues in this period. Their court, the army, and the church. Also, many of the child emperors of the period were virtually powerless compared to their military strongmen, a power that could only be broken with murder. However, although the personal power of the emperor could fluctuate from the great commanding presence of an emperor like Majorian to a powerless figurehead like Libius Severus in a flash, the institution of the emperor had become far more stable during the Dominate than it had during the Principate. Dynasties that lasted beyond a generation started to appear. Children could reign for decades without ever stepping foot on a battlefield, or assassinated to make way for an opportunistic official. It could be said that the emperor was all-powerful. It simply depended on how they used that power. If you have enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe and check out the SPQR Historian's video about the power of the Emperor before the time of Diocletian. If this is something you've enjoyed, then you'll definitely enjoy that video too. And this has been Eastern Roman History.